Good morning, everybody, and welcome to SML. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, today uh, this uh, application that we built to detect uh, outliers in high dimensional uh, sensor data. And uh, this work was done together with my colleague uh, Elahi, uh, who's there. <laughs> um, uh, before I start, I'd like to uh, just uh, tell quickly uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, so I'll start by uh, introducing you to uh, what we do here at ASML, uh, then go and talk about the particular product that I work on, uh, and, and then touch upon uh, this application and the algorithms that were involved in building this uh, particular application. Okay, so um, semiconductor chips are basically all around us. Um, uh, they're omnipresent. Uh, you can find them in your cameras, uh, smartphones, uh, televisions, uh, smartwatches, automobiles, everything, right? Um, and uh, uh, for, for these semiconductor devices, the transistors uh, are the smallest uh, components uh, on this uh, semiconductor chip. And uh, in fact, they form the basic uh, functional building blocks uh, for computing and, and storage. And uh, for in a transistor, there are billions of these. Uh, so in a, in a semiconductor uh, device, there are billions of these transistors. And um, uh, the semiconductor industry has been continually driven uh, by, um, by striving for, to make these transistors uh, smaller um, uh, year after year. And the reason is that the smaller the, the, these uh, transistors you're able to make, the more of these you can squeeze in per unit area of your chip. And therefore, uh, you get more processing power from these. Um, uh, and as an additional advantage, what also happens uh, is that your chips become uh, more energy efficient. Um, we here at ASML uh, provide one of the key uh, technologies uh, in, involved in the manufacturing of semiconductor chips. Um, uh, before I go on to talk about this key technology, um, I want to start with a short video. Uh, so this is your iPhone, uh, probably not the latest. Uh, and as you look into this iPhone, uh, you see this uh, A8 chip. A silicon uh, wafer can build thousands of these chips. Um, as you start zooming in into this chip, you see an architecture that consists of layers uh, stacked all on top of each other. As you zoom in further, uh, you see that uh, uh, the first few layers are uh, the ones that define uh, what a transistor is, and the uh, layers on top of that uh, are the ones that are the interconnects uh, that provide uh, power to these transistors. Um, as you can imagine, uh, you're talking about these transistors which are very, very tiny. They're not even visible to the naked eye. And therefore, uh, uh, what is important here is that uh, these, all, all these layers that are stacked on top of each other need to be very well aligned. Uh, any misalignment here will cause connection failures and cause the chip to underperform. Uh, overlay is a parameter that defines how misaligned these layers are. And this is a critical parameter uh, that uh, directly relates to the yield that our customers can get uh, from their manufacturing process. So we here at ASML uh, need uh, to strive to always have this overlay, which refers to the misalignment between these layers, uh, within a very tight budget. Okay, so uh, the key technology that I was talking about is called photolithography. And uh, basically, before I talk about that, um, it comes from the word uh, lithography, uh, which uh, is derived from two Greek words, lithos, uh, which means a stone, and graphene uh, refers to uh, writing. So basically, uh, this was the way of printing, uh, predating the modern uh, printing technology. And what you have here is that uh, you have your lithography stone, uh, which is prepared through a series of step, steps such that um, the ink that you apply on it uh, uh, selectively sticks on the graphic that is drawn on it and therefore can be transferred as a mirror image onto this paper when the paper is placed and applied uh, some pressure on it. And um, uh, in fact, here we at ASML, we do something which is kind of similar. Oh. Okay. 
okay. Uh, so yeah, this is something that uh, is, is, uh, is kind of similar to uh, what we do here at SML. Um, so to make an analogy, uh, the light is, is like the ink and um, the graphic is, is like the template, uh, the photo mask, uh, the one that is shown here. So when you, when you have light projected on this uh, photo mask uh, that is shown in the picture on the right, um, uh, this uh, allows light to pass selectively through it such that uh, what is exposed on the wafer is uh, an inverse image on, of what the template uh, is in the photo mask. Um, before uh, performing the step, uh, the wafer is coated with a photosensitive material, such that only certain parts of the wafer uh, uh, where light appears um, can change their chemical properties and, uh, and then be degraded away. And uh, through a series of steps that involve uh, like a deposition and etching, uh, and, and alternating between these, you can actually create all these tiny features uh, that I, I just showed you, and then you can make these ships. Um, so um, overlay, uh, as I just mentioned, was one of the critical parameters uh, that is very crit uh, that is uh, that our customers need to worry about. And we are at ASMLs make these machines that enable photolithography. These machines uh, pr produce thousands of wafers uh, uh, per day. And uh, being a mechanical device, the, the, the machine is subjected to drifts over time. And if you are talking about overlay, which is measured in a few nanometers, so by the way, a nanometer is uh, 10 raised to minus 9 of a meter. So we are talking about really small features. And to ensure that uh, these features are kept in tight control, um, uh, we need to measure and then set up a feedback control uh, loop to control our scanners. And for the measurement, uh, um, this is the machine that we also build at ASML, uh, which is called uh, the Yield Star, and I work on this. And um, uh, through this uh, measurement, uh, we are able to uh, control overlay uh, for our customers. Um, so Yield Star is an optical-based um, uh, uh, tool that provides very fast uh, solution for uh, wafer metrology, which is basically measuring wafers. And um, this uses uh, 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 the principle of scatterometry to measure what is on a wafer. Uh, so uh, the scatterometry, scatterometry refers to uh, the fact that when you have a, be a beam of light um, incident on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, any structure, and as it reflects back, then it carries information about the very structure uh, as light interacts with it and uh, comes back. And by looking at this information uh, and then combining it with some machine learning models, uh, we are able to provide a very fast uh, solution to measuring uh, uh, overlay on wafers. Um, and the principle basically is that overlay, since it's a misalignment, any misalignment uh, will show up in, uh, in the symmetry of the beam that is also reflected back, and then you see it as a signal uh, that, uh, that uh, measures overlay. Okay, so uh, this is a schematic that shows uh, the yield star sensor. And uh, this is measuring very close uh, to this uh, silicon wafer. Um, and uh, well, uh, as I told you, we, need, we use uh, machine learning solutions uh, to measure overlay on wafers. And any kind of machine learning solution um, requires good training data. Uh, what I mean by good training data is that, uh, that if there are any outliers, you need to detect them and take them out. Right? So here, uh, what you see is, uh, is the performance of our machine learning model uh, when uh, there were some outliers in our training data. Uh, what is shown here are true values versus predicted values. Right? So for a good uh, model, uh, the correlation between these two should be very high. And what you see here is that the correlation is not very high. Um, so the model is not performing well. You can actually uh, trace this back uh, to uh, certain uh, points in your data. So what we are measuring is uh, on the wafer. Every wafer has certain fields, uh, and these fields are uh, kind of repeated uh, in blocks over the wafer. And what I'm showing you here is a one particular field. And in each of these fields over the wafer, what you find is there are these three structures which are, which are different in sizes. And uh, because they are different in, in their sizes, they produce a different signal. And if you uh, just combine all these things together, um, uh, you get a, a model that underperforms. So these, in a, in a sense, can be interpreted as uh, outliers for the data. Um, if you are able to uh, somehow uh, identify these structures and remove them uh, uh, from the training data, 
uh, then you see that your model starts really improving. You have a much larger R square. And now the question is, well, um, you could detect them by, for example, looking at the wafer with scaling electron microscope. But that is a very expensive process, and it's not fast enough. The question is, how can you detect and filter out these outliers uh, directly from your, uh, from your data using uh, uh, unsupervised methods? And, and that's what I'm going to talk about. But before I go there, uh, let's start by asking the question what an outlier is. Um, one of the definitions I like is that it is an observation that deviates so much uh, from uh, the rest of the observations that it really starts arousing um, suspicions about the fact that it might have been possibility, possibly generated from a very different mechanism. Um, so um, to detect an outlier, uh, what is important is uh, a certain distance contrast. So let me explain. What you see here is, is, is an outlier, and you can clearly say so, uh, because uh, it is very different. Uh, it is very far apart from the rest of your data. Right? So the distance contrast that I was referring to is basically the following. So DO denotes the distance from this outlier point to uh, uh, the, the inliers, say, say. And di refers to the distance within these inliers, so the, the intra-cluster distances. And if this is large, then you can clearly say that this is an outlier. On the other hand, uh, the image that I show here, um, it's not so clear that this is an outlier. Uh, and the reason for this is that distance contrast is low, uh, which comes from the fact that, well, this point is not as largely separated from the data, and the data also has more spread within it. Right. So um, now in high dimensions, if you want to look at this distance contrast, things become kind of tricky. And this is related to a, a, a well-known uh, phenomena, which is known as the curse of dimensionality. Uh, to explain that very quickly, um, I'm, I, I have, uh, uh, let's say you have uh, some eight points, and you try to put them in uh, boxes of different dimensions. Right? All of them have the same unit length. And you see two things here. Uh, the first thing you see is that, well, the data is more densely packed uh, in lower dimensions, which is obvious because uh, you have more space to fill the data in high dimensions. The second is that if you start looking at the ratios of distances between these points, so let's say you focus on the distance uh, to the, the first two points and the distance between the end points, if you're looking at that ratio, uh, that is very different in 1D uh, compared to uh, the, that ratio in higher dimensions. Right? Uh, so what happens is that um, in higher dimensions, uh, almost all the distances become kind of similar, and therefore these distance measures start losing their meaning. And this is uh, referred to as the curse of dimensionality. So uh, we suffer from this problem because our signal is a very high dimensional signal. We have thousands of pixels on our sensor, uh, and uh, in addition, uh, we have a lot of noise, um, which would mean that uh, things uh, become very tricky when you're trying to detect outliers uh, um, in, in, in relation to the distance contrast that I was just talking about. So let, let's look at this in more uh, detail. So if you'd like to try to write down this uh, ratio of these two distances, uh, because we are talking about Euclidean distances, you just basically take the differences in each dimension and then uh, square and add them. Um, well, one more thing I'd like to add at this point is that because uh, although our signal is very high dimensional, uh, what we are looking at is are structures which, which are not that complex. They are kind of uh, simple structures, which means um, that the latent uh, representation of this data, the dimensionality of this latent space, is much smaller. It's probably 5 or 10. It's not as high as, as the number I, I've shown uh, there. Which means that uh, there is, of course, uh, that, that you can somehow uh, think of uh, this data lying on a, on a much lower dimensional embedding. And it, it, the nominal distances refer to uh, the distances uh, uh, without noise. And if we talk about, say, like white noise, uh, which is basically additive in each dimension equally, then what you have in the, is, is in this ratio, uh, the, the, term, the noise term that is dominating. So n, capital N refers to the number of dimensions and ref, small n refers to the noise term. And when you have large dimensions and you have a noisy signal, then the second uh, term uh, starts domination, dominating. And then what you have is this contrast becoming close to one. And I, I, as I, uh, well, on the other hand, if you were to do a dimensionality reduction, what you would then see is that um, if there was an outlier, uh, then you would be able to have a much higher uh, distance contrast. 
So the basic takeaway from the slide is that uh, when the dimensionality goes, uh, becomes very large, this distance contrast, uh, even for points with outliers, starts getting closer to one, and then therefore it means it is difficult to detect outliers, and the solution is to look into dimensionality reduction. Okay, so well, about dimensionality reduction, you can think of uh, two kinds of methods, maybe linear and nonlinear. Uh, methods like PCA would clearly fail on, uh, on manifolds like this, uh, which are kind of curved, and therefore you need to think of uh, uh, nonlinear ones. But um, uh, a better way to think about uh, these uh, dimensionality reduction techniques is to uh, think of uh, ones that preserve uh, global distances versus the ones that preserve local distances. Right? So PCA is a, is a method uh, that tries to basically preserve a variance in your data. And because uh, variance is, is computed by L2 norms, uh, this is a method that really emphasizes um, a global distances more. Um, whereas methods like uh, TSNE or UMAP are ones that um, try to uh, discover the embedding of the data by looking more c closely into uh, the local uh, distance relationships. Right? So to, for example, to discover this embedding, uh, a naive way would be to start connecting all the points that are within a certain neighbor, and then you can discover this. Um, and well, now if you want to detect outliers, um, then if you think of methods that look into the first kind, uh, are, are, they would not be suitable because outliers are ones, uh, basically, which, which, are, um, which are kind of extreme points. And therefore, if you try to focus on distance, uh, on, on methods that preserve more of global distances, uh, they would uh, kind of uh, bias the very embedding that you're trying to discover. Right? So you should look into the methods of the second kind. Um, well, the method that we use here in our application is, is called UMAP. Uh, it stands for Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. And um, uh, while I do not have the time to explain to you how exactly it works, um, uh, I would actually refer you to a very excellent talks by the author of this method, so Leland McKeens, which are available on YouTube, where he explains exactly how this works. Um, I'm only going to give a very uh, rough schematic. So let's say you have a, a representation of your data in high dimensions denoted by coordinates xi, and you would like to have the proje them projected uh, through nonlinear methods uh, into a low dimensional representation with coordinates yi. The way the problem is solved is through an optimization problem, which tries to preserve the, the distance structure in your data. Right? Uh, while methods like TSNE and UMAP uh, all emphasize um, uh, local distances uh, more than the global ones, um, uh, yet there is always a trade-off to, to be made in uh, uh, basically choosing what local exactly refers to. And uh, that is done through this parameter NN, which refers to the nearest neighbors, uh, which basically is, is, a, is, a, is a parameter that you have to tune for your application. Um, uh, and a large values of this uh, nearest neighbors basically emphasize more of the global dis uh, differences in your data while if NN is chosen to be small, then they emphasize more of the local uh, differences in your data. Um, uh, this is a parameter that we have had to kind of choose uh, once for a, a kind of, for a particular kind of application, and it is kind of more or less robust. But of course, if you have a very different application, you might need to uh, retune this. Well, once, now, uh, once we have uh, actually uh, done a dimensionality uh, reduction of your data, uh, and have, uh, have, have, it, have it projected on a lower dimensional space. Um, to detect outliers, what you would need uh, to do is to run a clustering on top. Right? So, um, and if there were outliers, they would clearly show up in this clustering. Um, about clustering, uh, what was used here was uh, um, an algorithm called as HDB scan, uh, which combines basically uh, uh, the advantages of density and a hierarchical based uh, uh, methods. Right? So um, uh, uh, regarding density based um, uh, clustering methods, uh, the DB scan algorithm is a quite a popular one, um, which basically works on the principle that it tries to identify a, a dense region in your data. Um, and to define what dense is, it requires two parameters, uh, epsilon and min points. So uh, the way it works is basically uh, around each point in your data, you create a, 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 a spherical ball with a certain radius epsilon. And if 
the number of points, number of neighbors that, that this uh, uh, radius encloses is greater than min points, you, you call that point to be dense. Um, and then uh, you basically start connecting all the dense points that are kind of nearest neighbors of each other, and that defines uh, 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 what a dense region is, and you associate that with a cluster. Now, um, the, the, the difficulty here is that you require to make a choice of epsilon, uh, which is not so clear uh, for, for application that is kind of unknown to you. Uh, more importantly, you require to choose a fixed value of epsilon. Right? So basically what you see here, um, uh, you have data with two different uh, densities. Right? So this was generated by, uh, from three clusters. So you have these two clusters with more or less the same uh, density, and you have the third cluster which is uh, spread out. And uh, what you find is that like a single value of epsilon will never work on this kind of data. Uh, and the reason is uh, if you choose epsilon to be large enough, then you can detect these two clusters, right? So the one on the left, and it merges the other two small ones. If you make this small to separate out these two smaller clusters, what you find is that the bigger cluster is registered as noise because that, those data points are not found to be dense enough. So uh, HDB scan tries to uh, correct this uh, by having only a single parameter. And um, the identification of clusters is, is done uh, by finding an ab uh, adaptive epsilon uh, depending on, the, on which region of the data are you looking for. So what you see here is this, you can, uh, it uh, autom automatically discovers that there are th three clusters um, and, and then is able to label them correctly. Okay, so coming back to the slide that I showed you before, we have this high dimensional uh, data from our sensors that basically looks at uh, overlay or misalignment between uh, two layers uh, 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 on, on the wafer. And this high dimensional data is, uh, uh, is basically uh, projected on a three dimensional space using UMA. Um, and what you see here is a representation of that. If you now uh, start correlating uh, the locations on the wafer for all these, uh, uh, all these uh, 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 dimensionality reduced data, uh, what you find is a clear structure. So you find uh, basically all the orange points uh, being clearly associated with the in layers, and you find three other clusters each corresponding to these three locations on every field of the wafer. So it, it tells you automatically that there are three kinds of outliers which are distinct from the other points. And um, uh, once, you, once you know this, you can filter them out. And as I just explained before, uh, you, you have training data which is cleaner and you have better uh, performance from your machine learning model. Uh, what is important typically at ASML is to have good interpretability of your results. So here, uh, in fact, uh, this was confirmed uh, by experts by looking at scanning electron microscope images that they, these were indeed very different structures that you were trying to measure, and, uh, and they uh, indeed show up, of course, differently in the UMAP embedding. Um, so at this point, I'd like to conclude and show you a summary uh, of what I just uh, talked about. So the, the first point is that uh, to look at, uh, to have robust machine learning solutions, you need to filter uh, outliers from the training data because the presence of outliers can cause your model to be biased in an unwanted way. Um, if you are looking at very high dimensional data, then it's a good idea to look at uh, dimensionality reduction uh, and then follow it up with clustering so that you can visualize these outliers and then can filter them out. And um, once you have done so, then you have much better performance from your model. And uh, in the end, uh, Python libraries uh, can be used to actually solve uh, real-world industry problems. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, say that we use a UMAP and HDB scan in particular here, uh, which are both available as open source Python libraries. Thank you.